how do you feel about the people that feel like Trump is racist? Yeah, let's see. I can remember one time I went, I went on to a conference in New York. I was a state judge. It's been 30 some years ago. And some people I knew were there and they said, hey, let's go check out some of the clubs. I said, okay. I hadn't been to a New York club, you know, and damn. So we go. So there's this tall white guy coming in and all the brothers hanging around with him. But he doesn't have bodyguard. He just walks in on his own, you know, and he sits down and, you know, he's glad handing and in the animated conversation with everybody. So who the hell is that? Oh, he's a billionaire we got around here. Dude's name is Trump. You know, Trump Towers. Oh, yeah, that's the dude that owns it. Oh, he's hanging with the homeboys. So he's dated black women before, like the woman he always showed up with on the red carpet thing. She was one fine model right before his current wife. Uh, I had... Now, I wasn't present, but I had three clients back in the 1980s, business clients, who, when I took the bench, I kind of left them in the lurch because I couldn't continue to represent them, but they got other counsel, and their problem was getting finance for their business. Well, 25 years later, I run into them separately. They don't know each other. They might. I don't know, but I didn't put them together. Question. Did you ever get that loan or that finance to get your business? Yeah. Well, what happened? Who'd you get it from? I got it from Donald Trump. And, you know, not only did they get the finance, they tell a tale that, well, I don't mean know if it's a tale, but the story is, is when they gave him the term check, he asked them if they were happy with what they were doing, were they satisfied he said, this is what I'm supposed to get, yeah. And he tore the contract up, tore the check up, said, my gift to you. Uh, you know, Jesse Jackson ran for U.S. president twice. Donald Trump provided his headquarters across the country and raised money for him to finance his run. That isn't too bad. So what are they talking about? She remember that thing about tell a lie long enough and loud enough. The real problem is he's not into the rainbow cult thing. He's not an acolyte, disciple, follower, or such like he's not into the unicorn. So he's an enemy. He also is staunchly into the manhood thing. Well, he said he grabbed some. Well, you know, I mean, he's talking to folk in a locker room. Some punk wants to go snitch on him. That's a punk play. You know, that's like somebody saying, baby, you know, I really love you and that man you're with. He ain't good for you. He runs around on you. You know, that kind of punk play. So when somebody's pulling that off, I'm not going to look down on it. And as a matter of fact, my first mother-in-law had a beauty salon for years, and I used to go down there and run errands for her, and I'd sit there and listen to the ladies, and I'm going, oh, wow, man, this is crude stuff up in here. Damn. <laughs> you know, the ladies are worse than the guys when it comes to not locker room talk, but beauty salon talk. So I'm going, whoa, damn. Wish I'd known this years ago. Hey, it's some... Damn. But one thing I would ask you, though, how you feel about Trump saying that he want to get a police immunity? It's what well, you have to understand what he's saying. Immunity is immunity, but it's qualified. In other words, if you're doing your job, OK, but if you ain't doing your job, it ain't OK. Like, for example, right here in the Memphis, there's a case where five black cops got indicted for beating this guy to death. Right. He had Crohn's disease, Tyree Nichols. So if it had been police randomly stopping a random citizen, that's one thing. But the point was, is the allegations are, is that the victim was screwing the baby mama of one cop, screwing the wife of another cop, and trying to screw a third cop's wife. So they found him, told him to back off. He wouldn't, so they went looking for him 
to beat his behind, which they did, but he had Crohn's disease and he died of the after effects. Now that's the story in the streets. So is that cop action? No, that's all personal. That has nothing to do with an immunity situation. The argument doesn't even come in because it didn't have anything to do with police work. You got a problem with your personal life and somebody uh, hacking into your, your women, you see. Now, that's the difference. See, what you saw do, this guy would not have gotten any of that immunity. Now, the immunity comes in like there's an armed robbery in progress. This dude's firing shots, and he shot two people working the liquor store. The cop shows up, shoots him, and the family says, why didn't you just shoot my baby in the leg instead of killing him? Well, that would be immunity because the guy's acting in the line of duty, you see. So that's like why you have the Castle Doctrine. Castle Doctrine has been the law for the longest period of time, but it wasn't codified. It was more common law. So what was happening, it, it, literally a case in one state was like this. Uh, a guy did a home invasion armed, and the homeowner was on the second floor in the bedroom, got his gun. And what went on is the homeowner was at the top of the stairs. The burglar is halfway up the staircase. They each fired a shot at each other. The burglar falls down and breaks his leg and sues the homeowner. Well, to clear that up so the homeowner wouldn't get sued by this guy for having a broken leg that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't burglarized the house, wouldn't have been shot at if he hadn't had a gun in his hand. They classified, codified his castle doctrine. You're on your own when you break off in somebody's house. So that gives the homeowner immunity. That's what they're talking about. Now, if you say you broke into my house and I'm tired of this. This is the second time. And the dude said, all right, man, call the police. I surrender. No, I'm going to kid you. Bam, bam, bam. See, that's not exactly what time it is, you know. I'm happy you clearing that up. Because when I was told that they was making it seem like, you know, Trump, he was giving the police permission to kill black people anytime they want, you know. So that's how they was making it seem. So, yeah, I'm happy you clearing that up, man. No. And see, he'll call the cop a coward. Remember that thing where that guy flagged down what turned out to be a female cop because she had a road problem and he was trying to get help and she shot him to death? Trump called her a coward, which is what she was. So, you know, he, he'll call it like he sees it. And that thing they're talking about, about the, the Park Five up in New York, well... It isn't that the police beat this guy, did a third degree on him. One of them's father brought the boy down and said, my son confessed to this. He needs to tell you what he did. So his daddy brought him down and the boy confessed to the police, not the police beat it out of him. And when all the rest of them confessed, who, you know, it's not like they saying they did it and nobody saying we had nothing to do with it. It was a pretty horrible crime. I mean, it was a bad crime, the Central Park Five. So in my perspective, many a time I'd had this happen, we have a motion to suppress a so-called confession. Okay? It's taped. So... I've got a setting where myself is the judge, the prosecutor, and the defense lawyer. We're going to go to my chambers with the court reporter, and we're going to look at the tape recording of the confession. This guy is in my courtroom. He's an OG. Yeah, man, I'm down with the posse, man. You know, like I'm holding firm, man. They lying, trying to put a case on me, man. You know, like I ain't done nothing, man. You know, yeah, and I'm you know, we're on recess and he's talking over the barrier. So no big deal. Uh, the lawyer gets back from an appearance in federal court. I said, counselor, you ready? All right. Uh, Madam court reporter, can you set up in chambers in the next 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, call the court back to order. 
court's in session remain seated. All right, counsel for defense is returned to court. From uh, We will uh, uh, take a brief recess and we will attend to listening to the tape pursuant to a defense motion to suppress the statement. You go back there and OG, he's in there and the, the cops are saying, young man, this is a serious offense. You need to get yourself a lawyer. You have an absolute right to have a lawyer. You have Miranda rights, and they read them to him. You go, I don't want your lawyer. I don't want to talk to my mama. You let me talk to my mama. I'll tell you anything you want, sir. Uh, your mama's not an attorney. We can't let her in. I don't want to talk to my mama. Yeah, pass him some Kleenex, John. I don't want my mama. And he's crying, snot running all down his face, and he just got through leaving him being a badass of in your court, courtroom, talking about, yeah, man, the OG hanging tough, man. They lying. Man, it wasn't me, man. I tell you what you want, man. We stomp, man, shot down, man. They the ones that did it, man. They just made me do this, man. I had nothing to do it. I swear to God, man, I want my mama. You see, you, damn. But the story that comes out on the streets is they whipped this dude and they falsely put a conviction, uh, a confession on him. You look at him, punk. And I say, oh, by the way, let's see, these individuals have testified to reduce bond. Let's say, I believe one and only short dog is Stomp and Lil Earl. Take them into custody. Uh, the other parties that were uh, unidentified heretofore and committing uh, as accomplices in this crime were identified by the defendant who informed the police of who his accomplices were. So take them into custody. There's no bond to be set. Man, what? You know, take them into custody. Man, you told on us. Uh, well, it seems he did. Come on. Um, Process him. See, OG gangster is a punk. He crying for he's crying for his mama. But that isn't the story that comes out. Or you represent somebody before that. I'm a pretty good criminal defense lawyer. Oh, you know, I want a whole lot of jury trials. So uh, you listen to your client. Yeah, man, my lawyer and I, we paid off the DA, man. You know, it was 50k, man. Fool, quit lying. You were in a car asleep in the back, and there were five of you riding heavy in the car, and I got you off for insufficient connection with the one joint they found in the ashtray. What the hell are you talking about? Don't tell that lie. See, it, I mean, they tell all kinds of stuff that goes on about trying to make themselves look good. Or, uh, I wasn't even there, mama. They lying on me. They just trying to put on case, man. I wasn't even there. I got an alibi. Fool, you know you are lying. You know what your client has told you. Man, do lying, man. I wasn't there. Well, I mean, he went to high school with you. Four other people went to high school with you. One of them gave the police your mama's address. Describe what they found you with. Now, you're not there. How did they describe what you were found with three hours later, what you had on? They lying. See, I know dude couldn't have seen me. He was over there lighting up a cigarette standing next to the lamp pole, and I was behind the dumpster. Wait a minute. How you going to know that if you weren't there? Well, you know, I wasn't there because he couldn't see me, man. He lying about seeing me. But you weren't there. No, nah, man, you know, I was there, but not there, man, because he couldn't have seen me. But you saw him. Yeah, man, you lighting up a cigarette, man. But he's told his mom and everybody they wasn't even there. They putting the case on him. So you can't tell because there's attorney-client privilege. You have to stick with the story he says. And there's a whole lot of that. And the reality is for the last 50 years in American justice, just a little more than two and a half percent of the people that are in the penitentiaries got found guilty by a jury. Ninety seven plus percent pled guilty and 84 to 87 percent, depending upon the circumstances, confessed. Now, there are a few that shouldn't be in there because they are actually innocent and somebody did put a case on them. Uh, Kamala Harris has a disproportionate number of people that it passed through her hands 
where she was in charge of the prosecution where that actually happened. So I find it odd that you have not just the occasional thing, not that your statistical rarity, but you got a, a you have a situation where there are a whole bunch of these instances. We had a woman that was the district attorney here in Memphis where the state Supreme Court, Harvard Law Review, Yale Law Review, Stanford Law Review declared her to be the most corrupt attorney general in the United States of America because she personally had more complaints and findings of prosecutorial misconduct against her as an individual than any of the DA's offices in the rest of the country had collectively over the same period of time. You know, so, I mean, you've got a situation where when it's a rarity, but you've got a lot of them dumped in your lap, something's wrong with you and there is a problem. And I am aware of some very bad miscarriages of justice. For example, I got the youngest person in the world on death row row off, got a stay of execution 23 minutes before they were going to execute him. He was 15 years and two weeks old on the date of his execution, scheduled execution. He's supposed to have killed three people 13 years old. One of them was supposed to be the grandson of the sheriff of the county in question, and two of them were supposed to be his aunts. But then again, the sheriff's wife turned up dead on a set of railroad tracks a a few weeks before that. And the sheriff said this wasn't his son who was married to the mama of one of the childhood victims of the childhood classmates of the 13-year-old defendant because that wasn't his kid and she turned up dead on some railroad tracks, and the mother was in jail doing 25 years. She got some slack because her husband gave the information they got a DC-8 confiscated with nine tons of marijuana on board and eight tons of cocaine on board. So there was two and a half, two and three quarter million dollars of cash that was photographed on the crime scene that disappeared between West Memphis, Arkansas and the crime lab in Little Rock. Nobody knows what happened to the two plus million dollars. Uh, A cab driver down the street had dated one of the older ladies and he turned up dead. So, you know, you're trying to deal with a 13-year-old kid and put all this on him. And the murder weapon, which was a knife that was covered with blood, had several identifiable prints that weren't his. You know, wow, we whoopee. So you get all kinds of things that go on. So sometimes it's real, sometimes it's not. But the public is gullible. And the other point is this. When they started going to a 24-7 news format, you wound up with 1988, CNN was about to go bankrupt. It was almost thrown in the towel by 1990, but they had the Gulf War. Then they became very relevant, and everybody around the world was watching CNN because a cruise missile just flew by the seventh floor hotel room made a sharp right bank at the end of the block, and then you could see the target flash, boom, where the explosion went off. And then what happened is a lot of people started going to 24-7, and there's not enough real news, so they started inventing news, talking heads, looking at a burning cabin, and saying, what do you think happened, George? I don't know, Al. Well, maybe, Al, what happened, the suspect was caught inside. I don't know, George, that's a possibility. But maybe did somebody tell on him in something? I don't know. So you 45 minutes, you're looking at the same burning cabin that they're looking at, and they're speculating. And then they got the bright idea when they got cell phones, they pick up on each and every incident of wrongdoing that in years past would have been ignored. 
and then sometimes to get it in perspective, try this. Just get your calculating function up on your cell phone and divide one by 360 million and see what percentage it is. You get a whole bunch of zeros after the decimal before you get to a number. So what they're doing is taking statistical improbabilities and they're making it look like it is the rule. Now, it's bad enough even when it is a small thing, but you have to understand a lot of what's happening is that the public is being hyped because they want commercial success in selling the commercial ad spots and they need people to view so they have a viewing audience. Now, we get a lot of hype and news is not what it used to be. Yeah, and speaking of death row, right, have you heard about how Kamala, she blocked evidence that could free an innocent man from death row? You heard about that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She's got a very high number of people that are in that situation. As I was alluding to earlier, if it's one occasion, okay, fine. Statistically, most DAs are not going to have that happen. And if it's a decent elected DA who is not one of these career prosecutors, it's going to trouble him. When you have somebody that has not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but 10, 15, 16 instances that happen under their watch, something's wrong with what that person is doing. So I find it interesting that Kamala is sitting there doing what she did when they had the George Floyd riots. She's raising bond for the people to get out of jail so they can get right back out, get put back in. Whereas when she was a prosecutor, that was the exact opposite of what she was up to at the time. So which one is the real deal? See, I put, you know, this system is crazy in the realities. I walked into a place to get a replacement jacuzzi for my house. The white guy that is the general manager runs up and he's just gushing over me. He's like 60 something. And he knocks five grand off the price of the jacuzzi. Shit, let me go buy this. Then I find out I gave him 12 years in the penitentiary for a drug case. But I talked to him about what he was doing. I just said, well, we're going to turn the record off. Let's talk. So you don't need to be in here, and you play it out to this 12 years. I frankly think you shouldn't need to go on to, tri go on to trial, but I know you got some other things. Now, somebody's going to kill you. He said, if you hadn't had that talk with me 30 years ago, I never would have, you know, got this. Or people, black, white, brown, red, yellow, walk up to me in Memphis and say, Judge, you remember me? No. Well, you gave me some time. Did I give you enough, son? Uh yeah, but it's that thing about manhood. That straightened me up. Now I got seven grandchildren and three children, and all of them are doing well, been married for 28 years. You know, thank you. Hey, okay. You see, it's like, what are you doing? It's not so much that you're doing something to somebody. It's just what you do is perceived to have a purpose, and what did you do with it? Did you just sit there and you a vicious somebody that's trying to throw everybody in jail? Or are you treating it like you're the village chieftain and you have to maintain law and order in your village, but meanwhile correct it and do something about it? See, prosecutors have an opportunity to do a great number of things to stop crime besides putting people in jail. So do criminal court judges. Some people bad-mouthing and call it social engineering, but sometimes that can be a positive process. Get people jobs, get them to thinking like men and women instead of helpless pawns. So they look at what's bad as an opportunity to become heroic by overcoming the adversity. 
See, you can work with people to set up things that will train them for jobs, that will get them out of this mess, get them set up with counseling. You can come up with things like I used to do, and sometimes I'd have a prosecutor that would go along with it, said, okay, this is a close case. Tell you what the court's going to do. It's going to reserve ruling on this trial. Since it's a bench trial, there's no jury. The court will reset this for eight months, and if you get through the following programs, which will require the so-and-so and so-and-so, when you come back in here, the court's going to render a not guilty verdict. Now, that understood by everybody? Well, you ought to, we think under the circumstances, that's okay. Or you get a situation where you have, this happened at Millington Naval Air Base. You have a sailor a chief petty officer, and you got a gunny sergeant who is a Marine. The chief stabs the gunnery sergeant to death is over a woman. So they didn't want this to go to a jury trial because they wanted to say, we need somebody who will apply the law and bring common sense, and you can't always count on what a jury is going to do. So it's bench trial. So the father of the victim was there, and I found the defendant not guilty. Well, the father stood up and advanced toward the defendant, and I highlighted, high signed the bailiffs. I thought there was going to be an incident. He stuck his hand out. He said, I told the stupid SOB somebody was going to kill him if he didn't stop this. Sh no hard feelings. You did what you had to do. Now, see, that's something that people did not get before when it was in the newspapers is all of this mess. Or I've had cases that went to trial in front of a jury and the newspapers are in there and the family's in there and they want blood and they want somebody to go get the chair and all of this and the rest. And you've had a two week long trial and the jury has a question. All right, bring everybody back in. Mr. Williams, would you see to it that the foreman reduces this to writing? You get the question. You keep a straight face, and you poll the jury. Is this your question, sir? So and so and so, ma'am, blah, 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 blah. All right, the court will now publish the jury's question. Your Honor, if we think the victim deserved to die, do we have to convict the defendant? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please retire to the jury room and refer to your written instructions contained in trial jacket number, so on and so on, and continue your deliberations and return such verdict as truth and justice dictate if you are able to do so without violence to your individual consciences. Thank you. Mr. Williams, please escort the jury back to the jury room. Now, everybody wants to see this guy on a fast track to the electric chair, and the jury that said they agreed that the victim deserved killing. So there's a lot of that goes on that's not necessarily what the jury hypes it up to be. Had a situation one time. The jury was all upset about this horrible rape. The testimony is it occurred in the back seat of a convertible. All right. There was a gun, but the gun was in the victim's purse. The victim said she was worried about being pregnant, so she stopped, got up off of him. She was on top, stopped the rate, climbed over the side of the car, walked 30 yards to her car, took her keys, opened her passenger door, got two rubbers or prophylactics out of the glove compartment, locked her car, came back, climbed back into the rear of the car, put a prophylactic on the dude and climbed back on so the rape could continue. And she's got the gun in her purse. Like, yeah, really? Jury didn't stay out long to acquit before they acquitted the guy, but I mean, it was one of these things that the papers were playing off as a real horrible incident. So what do you say about that kind of thing? See, these are the realities of the real world, and it's not necessarily playing into the entertainment value that news often has for the public these days.